In a moment, our brother Andrew will come and preach from God's Word. But first, let us read from God's Holy Word this morning. The passage for this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we can be here this morning and that the beginning of the new year is also the Lord's day. Uh, We thank you, God, that we have been called to a living hope, remembering that everything was finished on the cross, that Christ has been risen and that we are now your children. Lord, we would just pray that uh, as we go through this text, that it would be a text that would encourage us and spur us on towards service of you. We thank you for everything that we have in Christ, and just pray that you would be with me as I uh, expound this text. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Well, it is almost that time of year, and not that time like Christmas, but the time of year where in a few weeks' time you're going to start to hear people say a few things. Uh, One of those things that you might start to hear people say in three weeks' time is, I can't believe that it's already at the end of January. Time just moves so fast. Um, That's the first thing. And then maybe the second thing that you might start to hear is, I have not kept my resolutions, my New Year's resolutions. Um, Now, there are a whole bunch of different kinds of resolutions that we can make as the New Year dawns. Uh, For example, there are lifestyle resolutions. We might call these the fitness, the finance, and the fun resolutions, the ones where we go on a new diet or start exercising, or we make some budgeted budgeting kind of goals, or we might uh, take on a new hobby or something like that. So you've got the lifestyle goals, and then you have the spiritual resolutions. Uh, Things like where you might say, I'm going to take a Bible reading program in the year, and in a few weeks' time, you'll get to about Genesis and be like, maybe this isn't for me. Um, (laughs) But then there's also prayer that, uh, you know, starts, uh, I haven't prayed enough, and maybe I need to be praying more this year. But the one that always gets the short straw or the one that seems to get the short straw when we're, when we're making these resolutions is our witnessing, um, is our evangelism. Now, for 2023, in the life of our church, the role of mission and evangelism is going to take a bit of a priority. Uh, you might see this in some of the ministries that we're going to be running in terms of mercy ministries or evangelism ministries. You would have heard me talk about this a few weeks ago. Um, then also next week, beginning in next week in January, we're going to be doing a sermon series about the God of missions and talking about God's role in missions and how we might do that as a church and then individually. And then, of course, we have this morning where we are talking about witness. And, of course, witness can have a whole bunch of different contexts about embodying Jesus as a witness for Christ. But this morning, I'm just talking about what it means to evangelize or to proclaim the gospel. And my hope and prayer this morning is that, first of all, it would challenge how all of us think about evangelism. Secondly, that it would stir our hearts towards, not only towards wanting to evangelize, but towards making some resolutions. And then finally, that we would put into practice some of these resolutions. Now this morning, even though we have a text um, to go through, it's not going to be going through it exegetically, but instead topically. And so before I get into the text and the topic of the sermon, what I wanted to do is give a brief overview about what the passage is about. And of course, we see that it's in 1 Corinthians. And so One thing to know is that uh, the church in Corinth was a church that Paul planted during one of his missionary journeys, and you can read about it in the book of Acts, chapter 18, but sometime after he planted the church, things started to sour. There started to be divisions and pettiness over who to follow and a sense of superiority between different people within the church. And with this context, plus some questions that they had, it caused Paul to write a letter. And... If I could summarize the intention of this letter in one phrase, it would be cross-centered wisdom for flawed saints. Now, (laughs) 
sounds like most of you know. In case you don't know, it, it, recently Craig has gone through the first book of Corinthians, and that's the way that he summarized the book. And I think it really well captures it. And also, don't worry, I won't be beginning any new series. We've just got the topical sermon this morning. Um, <laughs> So, with the passage where we find ourselves in our passage this morning, we find ourselves at the beginning of the letter. And basically, because of these divisions, because of this pettiness that was going on, Paul wants to begin the letter by reminding the church of two things. First, the wisdom of God, and secondly, the foolishness of their salvation. This is what he does in chapter 1. And so he says that the wisdom of God is Christ crucified. And he says, basically, from a human perspective, this wisdom is foolishness to the world. From the human perspective, talking about a crucified Savior is foolishness to the world. But from God's perspective, this foolishness is still wiser than any wisdom that a human can concoct. In fact, God uses this foolishness, the foolishness of the cross, and he uses this to reach foolish people because we don't have any ounce of true wisdom. And so he moves then from the wisdom of God for them to then consider the foolishness of their salvation. And he says basically to the church, look around at you guys. You know, there's not many of you who are wise. There's not many of you who are powerful or in positions of prestige. And it allows him to say, well, you know, the mystery of God is that God doesn't choose regularly those who are strong and wise. Those who are strong and wise and wise in their own eyes, they tend to reject Christ. Instead, he chooses the weak and the foolish, chooses people like you and me. We're the ones who received Christ and we're the ones who are his trophy. And so when he says for us to look at the church, what he says basically is that you have weak and foolish people who have believed in a weak and foolish message. And the reason why this has happened is because whatever power or wisdom we are going to have as a body of believers, as a church, it's going to be Christ's. And whatever boasting that we're going to have as a body of believers or as individuals, it's going to be in the Lord. And that's why Paul concludes at the end of chapter one, he says, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. In other words, God is the one who gets all the glory. And, and Paul's point in all of this is this, is that God's saving wisdom and power is displayed through cross-shaped weakness and foolishness. God's saving wisdom and power is displayed through cross-shaped weakness and foolishness. And the reason why this is important is because as it transitions into our passage, that if the message of the cross is foolishness, and if the actual substance of our salvation seems like foolishness, then as Paul talks about his own evangelism or his own witnessing, it is also going to look like foolishness. And so with that context, I wanted to just read through our text again for that kind of just broad sense of what's going on, saturate us as, I, as we go through the text. And this is what he says. He says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I didn't come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech, weren't, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. In other words, what Paul's point has been up to this point is that his efforts in evangelism were based in weakness and foolishness. It was delivered to people who were weak and foolish, and they believed in a message that was weak and foolish. And the reason why is so God's saving wisdom and power is displayed through these means. The content of the message, the delivery of the message, and the even belief in the message seems like total foolishness. But the reason why is so God is the one who gets all the glory. And now we could be done and dusted and, you know, sing our closing song and carry on with our New Year's Day celebrations. But this morning, what, we, what I want us to use our passage for is, like I said, not exegetically, but so that we might be able to glean cross-centered wisdom about evangelism, about what it means to be a witness for Christ. And so even though evangelism isn't the primary focus of the text, as Paul starts going through this, he starts to give us insight into his perspective about evangelism, into what it looked like when he was evangelizing, and what was the theology that was driving his evangelism. So the question that I want to ask this morning is, what does cross-centered evangelism look like? Or if we could put it more practically for you and I, how does God want to shape 
my witness. And it's a simple outline that I have, which is in verse 1, we're going to look at the man of witness. In verse 2, the message of witness. In verses 3 and 4, the method of witness. And in verse 5, the motivation of witness. So first, the man of witness. And basically, when we're considering this, the question that I want us to ask is, when can I be a witness? And this is what Paul says in verse 1. He says, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. And you know, there's a few things that might serve as some barriers to us before we could engage in evangelizing. Some things that we might say is that I'm not clear enough in how I articulate the gospel, or I don't know how to answer all the questions, and so I'm not going to talk to someone about the gospel because I'm a bit worried, or I'm not well read enough about this particular area or this particular religion before I engage in the gospel. In other words, what we tend to say is I'm not good enough, or I am not smart enough. And because I'm neither good enough nor smart enough, I am not ready to share the gospel. And what does Paul say? He says, I did not come to you with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I did not come to you with brilliance of speech or wisdom. And it's a wonderful thing that the way of God is that evangelism is not about how good you are or about how smart you are. The wonderful thing about God is that he uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary purposes. You look at the life of Christ and he chose fishermen, tax collectors, political zealots, people who didn't advance through the religious school, but instead had to go on and take a trade or something else. And yet when Jesus calls them, you can see their passion to wanting to serve God. And these are the people that God calls, people who don't have brilliance of speech, people who do not have brilliance of wisdom. And so to answer our first question of when can I be a witness, believe it or not, brothers and sisters, If you have been saved by Christ, then you can be a witness for Christ. If you have been saved by Christ, you can be a witness for Christ. That is the man of witness. All of us in this room today who have been saved by Christ are called to go and be his witnesses. Second thing is the message of witness. And when we think about the message of witness, what we often would ask is, what should I share What should I share when I'm going out evangelizing to someone? And Paul gives us a very simple answer. The answer he gives us is Christ crucified. In other words, proclaiming his death. This is what he says in verse 2. He says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when we think about some messages of ways of doing evangelism, for some people might say, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Other people might say, you're a sinner and you need to repent. And in both of these messages, what we see is the magnification of one thing and the diminishment of the other. In one message, it magnifies the love of God while not emphasizing the truth of the sinner. In the other way, it magnifies the truth of the sinner without emphasizing the love of God. And the result of this is that someone might hear this message and they either think, God loves me for me and there's nothing that I need to change. Or they might think that God doesn't love me, and if I just change enough, and if I just repent enough, then he will accept me. And Paul says our message as witnesses of Christ is to speak the truth in love. And that message can only be found in Christ crucified. When we talk about a crucified Savior who died for our sins, we see the height of God's love for us. But when we talk about a crucified Savior who died for our sins, we also see the depth of our sin. That this was the extent that it took for God to save us. That this is the extent of God's love for us. And so only in the message of Christ crucified do we see the glory of God most fully revealed. It's like we sang in our first song, that this is the place where justice and mercy meet. And there's just two things that I want to note about this. The first one is that it is a simple message. If you're wondering why God can use you, it's because you know the message. You know the message because the message of your salvation is also the message of your witness. Second thing I want you to observe is that it is a verbal message. There's a saying that some might use that preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Paul says, no. He says, yes, it's good to embody Christ. Yes, it is necessary to embody Christ. 
But faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. It is a verbal message that brings people to faith. Then the third one is the method of witness. In other words, how does it look like? Now, we're going to spend a little bit of time here, but this is what Paul says in verses 3 to 4. He says, I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Something we tend to think about when we think about evangelism in the Bible, in other words, in how evangelism looks, um, is that it's either usually done where it's preaching to a crowd or approaching strangers, random people on the street or something like that. And, you know, we do have examples of that in the Bible. We see Peter at Pentecost preaching to a crowd and seeing people instantly believe. And then we see Christ going up to the Samaritan woman and we see, he, he, uh, see her instantly believing. And so when we encounter passages like this, what it can tend to do is shape our view of evangelism that not only the normal way, but the best way of doing evangelism is that it's an activity that's done out there, that I need to go out of my regular routine in order to preach the gospel to unknowing people, in order to approach strangers. And if we don't have this kind of a view of evangelism, we at least have the view that we might say, well, it's just a one-off preaching of the gospel, that I just have to get the gospel out to someone, and then once I do, I can say, well, look, it's, it's there with you, and now I don't have to do it anymore. And the reason why I'm talking about this to begin with, when we're talking about the method of witness and how do I share the gospel, what we read in verse 3 at the beginning, Paul says this. He says, I came to you. Now, usually we can think about him saying, I came to you, that you know, he was preaching to a crowd or he was approaching strangers. And of course, this might be true to some people who are in the church. But what we have to remember is that Paul spent 18 months in Corinth. He made tents for a living. He knew people by name. He had been in their homes. And so when we read, I came to you, maybe, maybe it was a one-off. Maybe it was to strangers or a crowd. Or maybe it was also, I came to you again and again and again. Maybe it was, I came to you while I was making tents. Maybe it was with some of his colleagues that he came to them. Maybe it was some of his customers, he came to them. Maybe it was during his free time and he was doing walk-up evangelism and he's writing to them and they're reading it and seeing, I came to you and they, I came to you. Or you remember when I came to you on the street? Or maybe during these 18 months he made quite a few friends and it was over dinner. And they're reading, I came to you, and they're seeing, he came to them. So the first thing to note about him saying, I came to you, is that it happens in all sorts of contexts and frequencies for people like us the person we might need to come to is under our roof. The person we might need to come to is in our workplace. Maybe they're one of your neighbors on your street. Or maybe they're someone where you get your hair cut. I came to you. People we know. The second thing is that when he says Christ crucified, sorry, the second thing that we need to observe about this is that when he says, I came to you, and we see this again and again and again, and then when we look back in verse 2 and he says that I preached Christ crucified, that he didn't just come to them and say, Christ crucified, and then comes to them again, says Christ crucified, and then comes to them again, says Christ crucified. He had a relationship with them. There was opportunities to ask questions. There was opportunities to hear their perspective. There was opportunities to meaningfully engage with them. Now, his goal was that Christ crucified would be the one thing that they would come away knowing. But it doesn't mean that he just continued to say the same thing. And the reason why I think that this is important is it frees us from thinking we have to have some kind of cookie-cutter mold of evangelism, of way of sharing the gospel. It frees us to truly engage with that person, to listen to them, to ask questions, to uniquely share the gospel based on our experiences with how we know that person. I came to you as a person. And the final thing that you should note is that he took the initiative. He came to them. And something that we can often wish for is, you know, the ideal evangelism situation is that we're just minding our own business, maybe whistling, walking down the street. You know, someone just comes to us on a chariot like the Ethiopian is like, can you explain this to me? And, you know, just have this fall into our lap and we're like, oh, thank you, Lord. I have now evangelism opportunity. You know, that's an ideal situation. 
but he says, I came to you. He initiated the contact. And it's a simple point, but it is a frightening point because it means that I come to the person. I bring the gospel. And if it is frightening, if you think that that's frightening, well, you're not alone because that takes us to as the verse goes on. He says, I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom. See, there's a few extra barriers that we might find when we're going to evangelize. We might have a lack of confidence in our personality. For example, we might say, I'm too scared, or I'm not that kind of confrontational person, or I'm not the kind of person who ruins relationships. You know, I don't want to be that guy. Lack of confidence in our personality. But we also might have things where we have a lack of confidence in our skills or our knowledge. Like I said before, I'm not articulate enough or I don't know enough to engage someone with the gospel. And believe it or not, brothers and sisters, but both of these reasons are examples of pride. They're examples of pride. And you might say, well, how, how is that pride? How is me being scared pride? And the answer is in the excuse. Because you see, it is also saying that I would evangelize if I wasn't as scared. I would evangelize if I wasn't as uncomfortable with tense conversations. I would evangelize if I had a stronger personality. I would evangelize if I was an extrovert. Or I would evangelize if I was this articulate. If I would evangelize if I was that equipped. Or if I, was, I would evangelize if I knew this much about this religion. In other words, my ability to evangelize is based on who I am. It's based on my identity. It's based on my strength, my courage, my stability, my clarity of speech and my knowledge of the subject. And what we tend to do is we set a stand and say, if I was this, then I would do this. Or once I learn to become this, then I would do that. And what does Paul say? He says, I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And he says, on skills and knowledge, my speech and preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom. In other words, it is okay to be weak. Because when you are weak, you find yourself relying on Christ's strength. When you are fearful, it's okay to be fearful. Because when you are scared, you are relying on Christ to be your courage. It's okay to be trembling as you're going up and about to have a conversation with someone because then you are relying on Christ for stability. And I can tell you, as someone who has evangelized, it took me months of weakness and fear and trembling to go up to someone. But in all those cases, he helped. He was there for me. And then going on, it's okay if you don't know that much. It's okay if you fumble and bumble through your words because you're relying on Christ for wisdom. The point is, is that how God wants to shape us is so that we might one day say, my ability to evangelize is not based on who I am, not based on what I know, but it is based on Christ in me. It's based on my identity in Christ, my reliance on him to strengthen me, my reliance on him to use my feeble words to save others. God wants us to shape us in this way. Now, if you attend our church regularly, something that you might have that you would be likely to have is a very high view of God's sovereignty in salvation. The question that I want to pose to you and to me and to all of us is how does this theology shape your witness? How does a high view of God's sovereignty shape how you witness? And you see, for Paul... The sovereignty of God in salvation was not just this static doctrine, this ethereal, out there doctrine, this something that I couldn't touch or reach, but it was deeply practical for him. It shaped his witness, and it shaped his witness because he knew that because God is sovereign, he doesn't need to be a genius. He doesn't need to be brilliant. And that's what we see at the end of verse 4, of something, a bit of insight into his theology about witnessing, which is that, it is demonstrating the Spirit's power when he is witnessing. And so what is the method of witness? How does God 
want to shape how I witness? If I could use one word, it would be this, reliance. Reliance on him to supply you and to save others. What I mean by that, reliance on him to supply you with strength to your weakness. Reliance on him to supply wisdom to your foolishness. Reliance on him to save others. That's the method of witness. It is a total reliance on God. And you know, this is a simple truth, but it is a hard truth to swallow. Because, you know, for those of us who struggle with witnessing, what this does is it disarms us. For all the barriers that we have put up saying, this is why I cannot dis- uh, evangelize, it disarms us. It takes away all those barriers and it causes us to be reflective. It causes us to ask, what is it behind my not evangelizing? What, what's truly stopping me? Is it my pride? Am I scared about looking like a fool for Christ? Is it my misplaced identity? Am I basing it too much in my own strength? Is, is it my lack of confidence in the message that it sounds too foolish? And I can tell you about the, the message one. You start talking to someone about a crucified Savior being your hope, it will sound a little bit weird. You will be wanting God to work in this situation. And for those of us who do witness, this is also a hard truth to swallow. And the reason why I say it also disarms us, also causes us to be reflective and say, who am I relying on when I witness? Do I rely too much on my personality or my abilities or my knowledge? Because once you start witnessing and once it starts to become comfortable, you can start to get confident in yourself. And here you have Paul, a brilliant man, not coming with brilliance, continually relying on God. It brings us to our final point, which is the motivation of witness. It says, what should motivate me? Why do I do it? Why, why do I share the gospel? And when we read verse 5, Paul says this, so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. So if I can just describe what Paul is saying, he's saying that so that when someone comes to salvation, after how you have delivered the message, everyone will say, it is only because of God. How could this person possibly believe in this message apart from God working in their life? And what happens through that is that God gets the glory. God is the one that gets the glory. And so how does God want to shape my motivation for witnessing? And this morning, what we've been looking at is a whole range of barriers that stop us. And something that you'll notice about all of these different barriers is that they're all about me looking inwards. And what God wants to shape me with, how God wants to shape me is for me to look upwards, for me to be able to prioritize His glory His glory above my pride. His glory above my identity. His glory above what my wisdom is. Because at the end of that day, it's not about my glory. It's not about how I look to others when I'm doing this preaching of the gospel, where I'm being a witness for Christ. What it is all about is about my desire for His glory, to prioritize His glory, to say, I am ready to look like a fool for Christ. And that is our motivation for witness. It is desiring His glory. See, Paul says, so that it might not be based on human wisdom. And, you know, if it were up to me, and I genuinely mean this, because this passage was genuinely convicting, if it were up to me to design this, how a witness should be, it would be to provide an intellectual message using articulate people to go to the power brokers of society and to deconstruct what they have to say because I am genuinely confident in the coherence and the brilliance of the Christian faith. But that is my human wisdom. And it is a method that I would have designed that is intended to bring me glory. But then when we look at God's wisdom and we look at God's plan, this is what it is. It is that He wants all of us to participate wherever we are at in our Christian walk. And he wants all of us to deliver a simple message, relying on Christ 
to supply strength to my weakness and relying on Christ to supply wisdom to my foolishness. Relying on Christ to use whatever the words that are coming out of my mouth, which are probably not coherent, which probably don't make sense, but relying on whatever's coming out of my mouth for him to save people because he is sovereign. And the reason why this is God's wisdom is because, like I said, when someone gets saved, he gets all the glory. That through my weakness and through my foolishness, Christ's power and Christ's wisdom would be displayed. So the point of our talk this morning, of our time this morning is this, is that Christ wants you to go and proclaim his death while relying on him and desiring his glory. So what is stopping you? Christ wants all of us, you, to go to people who are in your life to proclaim his death, this simple message, while relying on him and desiring his glory. So genuinely, what is stopping you? What is stopping me? Now, just there's five points of application that I, I hope that most of the sermon was quite applicable. But thinking about New Year's resolutions, uh, five C's of application to think about as we go off into the new year. So the first one is confession. And what I mean by this, um, to make a resolution, is in your own time to go home and to pray and reflect, to genuinely ask yourself, First of all, am I evangelizing as I ought to? Am I being a witness as I ought to be? And what's truly stopping me from evangelizing? That's the second question. What's truly stopping me from evangelizing? And after much prayer and after much reflection, get a blank piece of paper and write it down. And then confess your sin. Realize that that may have come out of nowhere, but... Yes, we are called to be witnesses for Christ. We are called to be fools for Christ. And God wants us to participate in his mission. You know, I think about um, an example of a household with a father who has children and he wants them to do various duties in the household. Now, I'm not a dad, but what I would stake some claims on is that every father when asking his children to, say, work outside, say, got four children, doesn't want one to be the brilliant one and says, I'm going to put my hand up and I'm going to do everything. And then while the others aren't actually participating in the task, the father could take on the task himself, but he wants his children to participate. He wants all of them to participate. And so some might be mowing the lawn ziggity-zaggity, others are butchering some various parts but it pleases the Father's heart that all his children are participating in what he has asked them to do. And so when we are not evangelizing, it does require confession. And it's something for all of us. If you are evangelizing, there's something for you to reflect on and pray about. Are you relying too much on your own strength? Something. None of us are perfect at this. The second one is to then um, make a commitment. And what I mean by that is rather than having a resolution of I need to do this every single day, to make a commitment for a new way of life. And what I would say about this new way of life is to fit someone in. Just one person in your life. Think about it and pray about it as to who you can fit in and find time for them in prayer and find time for them in person. Try to have coffee with them. Try to build a relationship with them. The third thing is to have a checklist. And why I suggest a checklist is some way of having some kind of measurement of whether you're going about it. And I'm not talking about a big checklist. So I've got two things, two testimonies to write. To write a checklist, and once you've done them, check them off. The testimonies are to write, how would you communicate the gospel to the person who works at the checkout? And how would you communicate the gospel to your hairdresser? And for those who have been losing hair, um, how would you do it to your auto electrician? You know, something like that. 
In other words, what would a testimony of yours look like if it was 30 seconds? And what would a testimony of yours look like if it was a few minutes long? That's the first measurable change, two things to tick off. The second one is to set yourself, and that, the reason why I say that is that those are things you are really in control of, really low bar, low hanging fruit things to offer. The second one is two conversations in the next six months. In the next six months, so don't set it for a year, can if you want. One is to have initiate a gospel conversation. It doesn't have to be to run through the gospel conversation, it doesn't have to be from beginning to end but try to initiate something that is more deep and meaningful than how was your week. And the reason why I say this is because before you initiate it, your palms will start to sweat. Your heart will start to beat really hard. You are going to be nervous. And my encouragement or my challenge to you is to have as a checklist in, in the next six months, can I initiate one gospel conversation with someone I've never done with before? And the second challenge of the two, of, from the two conversations is to bring someone, not to invite someone, but to bring someone along to Hope Explored. See if someone might come. It's a simple, it's not a gospel conversation, you can ask as many people as you want, hey, my church is holding something on. Would you like to come? Something as simple as that. As you would have heard a few weeks ago, Hope Explored aims to have, be as low of a bar as possible for people to just to come into the door and to experience what it looks like to discuss meaningful things with Christians. So those are the two checklists, two testimonies and two conversations or two interactions with people. The third thing is to correct. And what I mean by that is to, you know, you get to the end of the six months, midway point of the year, how am I doing? Am I smashing it? Can I fit in a few more? We don't want to do this legalistically and say, well, I've done my one, I'm done for the year. Have I set too high of a bar? Maybe I should scale it back. Again, this is not about failing a New Year's resolution and then just giving up on the whole process. This is about a new way of life. Fifth, be charitable to yourself. You are going to fail far more than you know in your efforts to initiate conversations and your efforts to communicate the gospel. And just remember that your identity is in Christ. Your righteousness and all your perfections that God looks upon you is because of his righteousness, not yours. Then as a small sixth thing that I didn't have on the list, but wanted to include it off the slides, is call. That is, if you are struggling with any of this, call your pastors. We want to help you. We want all of our church to be participating in the mission of God in our own way. And if you need someone to pray for, you need, you need to pray with someone to pray for how you go about a conversation, call. I want to have a coffee and talk about how, how you'd navigate a conversation like this, call. We want everyone in our church to be witnesses for Christ. And so with that said, um, that's all. Just hope that this year, in 2023, we may all become better witnesses for Christ. How about we pray? Father in heaven, God, we thank you for the salvation in Christ, that we have forgiveness of sin through him, that we might have life with you. Help us desire for more people to have life with you, Lord. Help us desire for you to be glorified in our witness. So God, we pray that you would help us understand what our sin is as we go back and reflect on what is stopping us from evangelizing. God, we just pray that you would give us strength and the ability. Help us really look forward to 2023. We thank you, Father, and we love you. And we love you in Christ and through Christ. And we pray in his name alone. Amen.
Besides that, I just wanted to close with a benediction, and it comes from Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Amen.